Hi class, I uh, hope everybody's doing well. Um, this is the brief mini lecture on managing suicide crises. So without further ado, um, let's go ahead and, and get into it. Um, so uh, today I'm basically gonna take you through two types of, of uh, crisis response uh, protocols. One you read about, um, which is the safety planning intervention, the SBI, uh, and I'm, I'll talk about that in a bit, but the first one I'm gonna talk about is what we use in the school systems um, that we sort of developed um, uh, over the years, and it's called the PEACE protocol. And PEACE stands for Preventing Escalating Adolescent Crisis Events. So pretty pretty clever uh, acronym there, I thought. Um, I, I can't take credit for it, it wasn't my idea, but uh, it is a, a pretty good one, I think. Um, and basically, uh, the PEACE protocol is um, a risk categorization system um, by which uh, adolescents that we see who are, who are voicing um, suicide risk are categorized um, into one of four levels. So we have a color-coded system, so it's green for minimal risk, the yellow for moderate, um, uh, orange for severe, and then red is is the highest level. It's 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 imminent crisis. And uh, you know, I want to be careful talking about risk categorization. Um, it's not perfect, and it at its worst it can prevent or it can it can um, give you a false sense of confidence. Um, but at the same time, risk categorization has some benefits that shouldn't be overlooked. Uh, the big one is that it um, it triggers an established response plan and prevents diffusion of responsibility. So, uh, if if a uh, a student is categorized as a, a yellow, we have a, a, a somewhat uh, standardized set of procedures that follow, and so it. it it, it keeps everybody on the same page. A second advantage is that uh, it facilitates communication between involved parties. As you can imagine, if you're talking to an adolescent who's voicing suicide risk, thinking about suicide, it's a pretty intense situation. And oftentimes, um, people on a treatment team have to communicate about that risk. So um, I have graduate students who see um, who see adolescents, and um, if they call me for for an emergency and they say, um, "Look, I've, I'm seeing a kid, and she is she is a yellow on the peace protocol," I have some idea of what kind of symptoms I'm dealing with. Um, so it's a kind of a shorthand with, without going through everything that enables us to communicate effectively. Uh, it also triggers, um, the categories trigger um, different referral options. Um, there are some things, you know, for the most part, um, greens and yellows, we can normally handle on an outpatient um, basis in, a, in the school setting. Orange and red, um, we may have to refer out to a higher level of care. So it, it removes some of those, those confusions around referrals. Uh, it's always important to um, uh, to make sure that if you have a response plan like this, uh, a categorization plan, that you integrate the resources that you have um, and 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 fill the the gaps that might exist. Um, so, for example, we rely heavily on um, mobile crisis. Um, through Daymark, the community mental health provider, if we think someone's at a particularly high risk, say in an orange or red category. Now, there are still some obvious flaws with risk categorization and with our, our method, the PEACE protocol. Um, I've said all, all semester long that risk pred prediction is bad and that continues to be the case, and it's dynamic. It changes um, um, often from day to day or even hour to hour. So um, it doesn't address long-term risk. So the, I say this recognizing that it, it has its flaws, but it's still, I think, better than, um, than not using some sort of system. So 
So here are the levels of risk um, or the uh, the characteristics of the risk levels of the various um, uh, the four levels of the peace protocol. And no, I want to make sure that these these are these are a um, they're not prescriptive levels. They're characteristic levels, meaning no no one actually meets every single criterion for a particular risk factor, and you can get some people that are in between. But um, what this is based on is prototype. So um, these characteristics are prototypical for a green case versus a yellow case versus an orange versus a red. And so green, these are our, our kids who have some current ideation, um, but it's fleeting, it's not very intense. Um, it, the, 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 uh, um, the sense that it just sort of pops into their head. There's um, maybe some past, I, more intense past ideation or intent, but no current intent or plan. Um, and there are some strong risk, uh, or excuse me, some strong protective factors, you know, um, social connectedness, supportive family, religious values, and fewer risk factors, um, particularly um, uh, um, access to means, past attempts, um, um, severe depression or anxiety, things like that. Yellow, um, there's current thoughts of hurting self or others, um, and they're, they're deemed to be mild to moderate in terms of their intensity and frequency. Uh, there may be some self-injurious behavior, but it is without explicit intent. Um, um, and, and furthermore, acknowledged, um, acknowledged no intent. Um, no or unreliable access to, to lethal means and at least one protective factors for some risk factors. Again, that's, that's sort of the prototype of the yellow. Uh, orange is the next step up. This is current suicidal ideation and intent, maybe a specific plan um, and or evidence of behavioral impulsivity. Again, not self reported impulsivity, but um, uh, evidence of impulsive behavior. Uh, uh, pot potential access to means, um, both means um, related to the plan and other lethal means. Uh, there could be self-injury with moderate frequency that where there's ambivalence about desire to die. Um, and then uh, risk factors, but still some protective factors. And then red is uh, the, the the really high uh, risk cases, and these only actually occur in maybe two, two to four percent of all of the uh, 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 risk assessment and crisis response uh, interventions that we do. So this is current ideation intent. Uh, realistic plan, um, maybe evidence of preparation or having ex reliable access to means. Um, it could involve a frequent self-injury um, or um, a history of past attempts and um, a, a multitude of risk factors with few protective factors. So those are the four basic levels. Um, and here's what we do typically in response to each. So. For green, this is this is what we consider minimal at risk. Um, no, minimal doesn't mean zero. It just means um, on the low end of the scale. So we're documenting, we're doing, uh, we're assessing coping skills, and we're doing check-ins uh, or um, perhaps some referral. And I often get questions about, well, what does it mean to assess for coping skills? So these are just some general questions on how we typically assess coping skills. Uh, we ask, how do you deal with problems that, that come up? Uh, and note a couple things about that question. It's open-ended, right? I'm not, it's not a yes or no question. They have to, they actually have to, to come up with an answer. And so the extent to which they're able to do that gives us some insight on how prepared they are to cope with stress. And then you can be a little bit more, uh, you can ask some follow-ups like, what's helped relieve stress? And 
what strategies uh, do you find helpful for dealing with stress? And what you're listening for is healthy versus unhealthy uh, or maladaptive skills. So healthy coping skills, when they're, they list people they can talk to, when they list optimistic uh, perspective, um, even when things are challenging, when they when they mention that things will change and that they have some some efficacy over whether or not things have changed, they they have some agency to change their lives. Uh, maladaptive coping skills, so substance use, anger, aggression, self injury, those kinds of things. Also, uh, control and suppression of emotions that that can be particularly um, um, dangerous over as a long-term strategy or or evidence that they, they try to numb out in some way they try not to feel anything at all and so those give us some barometer of how they deal with stress and 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 what they could would be able to do on their own as an alternative to self-injury or or even a suicide attempt yellow is low to moderate risk um, so here we assess and discuss um, coping skills. We conduct an SPI, a safety plan, also means uh, reduction. And there's some outdated language there, I'll have to fix that. Uh, but um, those those are done as a matter of course, both of those things. Um, at this level, we typically call parents um, with very, very few exceptions. Um, we ask about, about um, what means they, they are aware of in the home. Uh, we, um, our, our students are instructed to seek consultation from, from um, us in these cases. And then, um, of course, always you want to document what you've done in these cases um, and then follow up with students uh, within the week and, and ideally with the, the very next day. Orange, um, we instruct students and school counselors to talk to us to the um, licensed mental health professionals immediately if they encounter this level of risk. We're contacting parents, we're setting up an emergency meeting. As I mentioned, we work a lot with mobile crisis teams uh, and we, um, um, Orange is usually grounds to, to call mobile crisis and have someone from Daymark come um, to, to do a, an assessment. That way we've got multiple people um, um, doing the assessment and we have more data. We may notify a school personnel of, of the risk. Um, usually that's a principal. Um, um, we might try to get other people involved, um, um, but not those who uh, are a risk. We, we try, for example, for we're working with high school st students, primarily some middle school students, we typically don't want to involve a significant other like a boyfriend or girlfriend because if you remember high school, those things can go south quickly and that could be actually uh, set, set a kid up for additional risk rather than additional safety. We do a family meeting, we complete a safety plan, we get every, everybody on board, the, the kid and um, the parents or guardians document follow up the next day and at this level um, this is sort of a call that we make um, as a team whether or not we could manage this um, this level of risk on our own or if we need to, to call in outside help for a higher level of care. Red is high risk this is all hands on deck um, for a case of red um, of a red piece protocol we don't leave the student alone, not even for a minute. Um, so somebody has to stay with the student, keep eyes on the student at all times. We're contacting mobile crisis immediately. Um, we're co we're contacting parents immediately. Uh, we're notifying school principal and whoever the crisis team at the school is. Um, um, typically, these are folks that end up at least getting assessed in a hospital, if not hospitalized. Um, not all kids who um, are classified as red end up hospitalized, but um, um, some do. Um, and a lot of them do end up going to the, to the emergency room. So um, 
you know, uh, as a backup, we try to make sure our safety plan is completed and that means reduction is completed as well. We document everything um, uh, and we follow up with the students as soon as they arrive um, back at school, whether it be the next day or um, and immediately if they are hospitalized for some period of time immediately after they come back. And for the red cases, we generally work as a team with outside providers. So they, their um, primary um, care provider might be community mental health. Um, and then we provide some extra level of care um, just to, to, to help them uh, manage their distress while they're at school. And so uh, those are, that's basically the PEACE protocol. So we've been using this for about six years now. Um, a, kind of a quick breakdown um, about, you know, and all the, and we handle anywhere from maybe 70 to 100 crises a year across three districts. Um, about half of those are get, end up being greens, about maybe 35% um, or so end up being um, yellows, uh, um, about 10 to 12% um, end up being oranges, and then a very small proportion ends up being red. Um, knock on wood, um, we haven't lost any students who have gone through this protocol to, to this point. Um, I know eventually if we do this long enough that, that almost certainly will change, but um, to this point, it's been an effective way to keep kids safe, um, and we have surprisingly few that are hospitalized. Only about 5% who um, who enter in a crisis um, end up um, in a in a, in a um, psychiatric hospital situation. So uh, we we greatly prefer to keep kids out of the hospital if it is safe to do so. So switching gears to the second part of this. Um, this is the um, uh, the Stanley and Brown. So Barbara Stanley and Greg Brown have developed this really wonderful um, safety planning intervention that is um, it's fairly straightforward. It should be done carefully, but it doesn't require a PhD to do this. Um, um, and it, there's some interesting background about this. Uh, about the Stanley and Brown safety plan. Um, they actually developed it as a control group in a large study um, looking at the effectiveness of cognitive behavioral therapy for preventing suicidality or reducing suicidality. So they were comparing CBT to the safety plan that they just kind of came up with as, a, as an active control um, condition. And as it turned out, the safety planning did just as well as the, the longer, more intensive CBT intervention. Um, so they went on and developed the safety plan independently. Um, and they've been doing, working on this for uh, about, oh, 15 years now. And so it's a, it was originally intended for emergency departments. Um, and um, it has since been utilized in a number of different settings, not just emergency departments. Um, so we use them in, in the school setting as well. Um, and it comes out of a, a need based on how, um, how emergency departments traditionally have handled suicidal patients. Um, often they're just holding cells while they uh, await a bed in a specialty care unit. Um, and so, uh, you know, rather than just having them sit there, um, safety planning represents a, a low intensity intervention that can be effective. The other part is that hospitalization is not always appropriate for, um, for non-acute suicidality. We, we generally reserve this for uh, imminent risk. And so in some cases, hospitalization can be contraindicated, but you, you have genuine and legitimate concerns about the person's safety over time. Safety planning gives you an additional tool to help um, to help keep that person safe. Um, and what safety planning really tries to do is not, it's not a cure for suicidality, but it does help uh, individuals weather those acute crises. So, um, We'll go through the six steps, but basically you're teaching them coping strategies. You're helping them think about 
supports they can utilize and and what to do um, in an acute crisis and also uh, reducing access to means. Um, so again, this is for when someone is at risk but not immediate danger. This is not meant to replace hospitalization, although sometimes I'm afraid it's used that way. Um, so again, there are six steps. The first is have the person identify warning signs. So what's, the, what's your first signal that you might be heading into a crisis or you might be spiraling or um, you, you might go down a path where you feel suicidal? What, how, would you, how do you know that you're, you're going towards that, um, uh, that situation? So withdrawal, um, increased thoughts about death, um, it could be lashing out, um, those sorts of things. Step two, uh, let's just think about some simple distractions first. So what are some pleasant things that you can do to distract you from suicidal thoughts, to, 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 re, uh, uh, to redirect you away from those, those depressing thoughts? Step three, um, who can you talk to that would be a distraction? Now, no, in this step, we're, we're not who we're not there yet to, uh, about contacting people that you can turn to in a crisis. But who can you just talk to that will put you in a better mood? They may not. You, you may not want to tell them that uh, that you're you're distressed or feeling suicidal. Just somebody that you can you can turn to that that's likely to to improve your mood and or distract you. Then the fourth step is people that you can ask for help. So oftentimes for students, this is close family members or a best friend or someone that they can turn to that they can disclose that they're, they're in a crisis and that, that would be able to help them navigate that crisis and keep them safe. Step five, um, you identify professionals or agencies that can be contacted. So we'll, um, typically we'll give them numbers for the crisis text line for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, the local emergency room, all of those phone numbers. So if they do need to reach out to somebody um, while they're in crisis, they can do that. And then finally, making the environment more safe by reducing access to means. And so Stanley and Brown put this at the end of the safety plan, but typically we, we do this earlier on. Um, and as a really a, a fully, separate, more intensive process than it's presented here. Um, and we, we do these things collaboratively. Let's see, yeah, so here's a, um, uh, a version of the ones we use. Um, you'll see here there's a, there's a step seven here, reasons for living. We've gone back and forth on, on this, and we've actually removed this because um, there's some thinking that, um, that just presenting these, if somebody is acutely suicidal, that these, uh, if these are no longer relevant, um, or they don't seem to be effective, or um, the person views these reasons for living differently, um, that it can prevent, present more of a risk than a, than a protective factor. Um, so we, we fill these out, these forms out collaboratively. So I'll typically sit next to a a student while we're doing these and we'll write down each of these and we'll go through all of these steps um, and really what you want to make sure you're doing here is um, is asking them okay you sure what would you t like so for step two um, what kind of things can you do on your own has that helped in the past uh, when hasn't it helped are there alternatives so you really want to help the person problem solve and think through each of these steps so we fill out these out collaboratively, and then typically I'll make 15 to 20 copy, paper copies of these and give them to the student. And I say, look, put these in your nightstand, on your dresser, on your bathroom mirror, wherever you need to put them so they're, they're easily accessible. In your backpack, carry one in your back pocket, wherever. And then the other thing we typically do is um, take a picture of it with, with the student's phone. So um, even if they can't find anything, they always seem to have their phones. So um, if they have their phone, they have a copy of it. Uh, some questions I got uh, about this. Um, a lot of them were about um, no suicide contracts. And yes, it is true. There, um, 
as mentioned in the reading, there's no evidence that they're effective and they're no longer recommended as best practice, but they are still done. And I think that's unfortunate. Um, it is, um, it does not seem to be the case that having a person promise that they won't attempt suicide makes them less likely to attempt suicide. Um, whereas with safety planning, um, the Stanley and Brown stuff, there is uh, uh, good evidence for, for that as a, a protective step. It is relatively new, um, and it isn't universally practiced. I got a lot of questions about whether or not this is done in most emergency departments, and I don't really know the answer to that. Um, I can tell you for sure it's not done in all emergency departments, and if I had to guess, I would say um, it's getting more popular um, in emergency departments, but I would pr I would still guess that less than half of of emergency departments are using safety planning protocols as part of their response. Um, um, you know, is this the best suicide treatment plan? I want to caution against that kind of thinking. Um, it's I don't think it's you know it's not meant to be a treatment. It's meant to put out a fire really and it's meant to be a, 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 a you know a, a, um, a safety device right so if you go in a crisis then you have this thing that gives you another set of options um, and it's a little different than treatment and I'm gonna wait and we'll talk about treatment um, next week when we talk about cams which sort of um, does both assessment and management of suicidality at the same time. Um, the last one in terms of SPI, how can internal coping strategies be measured? Can a clinician ever know if a student, uh, a suicidal patient is using these strategies or approving on them? No, um, but you can do check-ins. And so if a crisis does arise, typically what you do is you revisit the safety plan and you see what worked and whether or not we need to revise things. So um, these things aren't meant to be one-time documents. They're meant to evolve as the, the person's situation evolves. And um, we try to revisit them at least every couple of weeks um, and towards the beginning of treatment, maybe even every week to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to do. So they are meant to be living documents and they're meant to uh, change as the, as the conditions and situation changes. So I know this one went a little bit long, but I got through, um, you know, most of, I got through peace protocol and safety planning in under 30 minutes, so I'll take it. Um, um, let me see. I think if I have any other announcements on here that I need to make, I don't think I do. Um, so look for the next video to appear early next week. Uh, and we'll be talking about treating suicidal patients over a, a little bit more extended period of time. Hope everybody stays safe and is well. And uh, I'll talk to you all soon.